Professor Stapleton, you're the fourth Goodhart Professor that I have the pleasure of interviewing for the archive. We're, we're making a tradition of hearing the views of the Goodhart incumbents at the start and end of tenure, so I'm extremely grateful to you for agreeing to add to the archive. And could I just start by asking you what you hope to achieve in your time here? Uh, yes, I, I'm um, hoping to map out a book about causation and consequences in the common law and private law. Um, I've done quite a bit of work on that over the last few years, and I thought this was the time to draw it all together and provide structure and start writing the book. Um, I noticed that you're organising a series of good heart seminars on private and public law. And as far as I know, this is a new innovation. Is, is this something that you just decided to do? Well, I, um, when we arrived, I, it, it was very noticeable that, in contrast to Oxford, where um, I teach every year a little short course of lectures, um, and where the faculty has instituted over the last five to ten years a very, very active program of discussion groups. Uh, here there, there isn't the same um, phenomenon and it was really a way so that I could, uh, we could discover what young scholars on the faculty were doing because there really seemed to be no ongoing platform um, in which research papers could be delivered. So it was really just a, in a, way, a selfish way of being able to hear our colleagues give papers and there was a great demand from it time we were talking to young people, there was um, a great enthusiasm for setting up something like this, and indeed the series was oversubscribed within 24 hours, so there's, uh, there was obviously a great um, interest and enthusiasm in the, in the faculty to have, have an outlet like this. I, I think there's, um, the international lawyers have, of course have their own set-up um, for delivering papers, so they're very active, but this was a way of... of providing a platform for public and private researchers to deliver their, um, their work. And, and they've been well attended? Yes, I mean, we've, we've, and everyone's very engaged with the papers, so um, we're very, very pleased with how the program is going. Um, I, I notice on the ANU mm. website that there's a very impressive list of your expertise, which includes civil law and procedure, comparative law, philosophy of law and justice, legal theory, jurisprudence, commercial and contract law, um, tort law, and I, I wondered in which of these you're lecturing here at Cambridge. Gosh, well, I, <coughs> I'll have to go look at that website because some of those I'm sure have been put there, not by me, I uh, wouldn't claim expertise in all those areas, so someone's clearly, um, uh, uh, someone at the university would like me to have expertise that I don't claim. Um, for example, I don't know anything much about procedure. Um, what I'll be doing here is um, giving some classes uh, to the aspects of obligations uh, class, and that will be on uh, causal theory and uh, scope of responsibility for consequences of conduct sourcing, as I was mentioning before, and that I'm mapping out my book about. Um, I've also already given some supervisions for students at St John's on a particular paper that I delivered to a discussion group here that was called sort of ad hoc discussion group that was set up when I asked it, was there a way I could give a paper and that was back in Nicholas' term. And in a way it was because it had to be set up ad hoc that I, I realised we, we could provide the, um, uh, a formal set of seminars this term for others to give their papers. Very interesting. Quite, quite a few of the eminent scholars that I've had the privilege of interviewing uh, started their academic life with taught as a specialist subject. And I'm thinking here of um, Professors Heppel and Jolivitz. Mm -hmm. But in later life, they seem to sort of change direction. And it seemed it was partly because um, taught was, was somewhat incoherent <laughs> and fragmented. Um, but you, you clearly you've you've stayed with you. Well, I think um, I don't think because a, a field is diverse, it necessarily is incoherent. Uh, what taught law is the law of torts. There are 
a, a number of areas in where, where the common law has responded to a particular co context. And the fact that the responses are different suggests to me, not incoherence, but just a richer, um, nuanced response. So it doesn't strike me as that the, the, the law of torts is incoherent. That's only incoherent if you want to cram it into a pure theory, and I'm not I'm not interested in doing that, so I don't feel that the law of torts is, is un, uh, unattractive because of its diverse norms. Um, but my, my um, research interests uh, tend to be uh, about foundational ideas. So for me, I'm, this is why I'm interested in notions, earlier on in my career, I'm interested in the notion of duty. Uh, I'm now interested in causation and consequences. Uh, in America, um, I became interested in product liability and again at the theoretical or, or structural, I suppose, um, uh, from the structural point of view that is trying to understand what are the analytical categories that courts use, are they best expressed the way they're currently expressed, or are they, would there be a better way of doing that, are uh, courts, practitioners, academics making a mistake describing a particular phenomenon as strict liability when in fact when one looks, one finds that it's not actually strict liability. So I'm interested in um, not the vast sweep of tool law. Um, I'm not interested in uh, knowing the details of doctrine across the wide dozens and dozens of torts that are out there. I'm more interested in understanding the, the architecture um, by which courts reason through problems in the field. And your expertise straddles the major common law jurisdictions. I'm thinking here of um, Australia, United States, and England. And that is obviously one of your specialities, this comparative um, aspect. And is this something that you highlight um, in your teaching? I think I can draw, I'm lucky that I can draw on different materials from those jurisdictions. I, there are major common law jurisdictions about which I know nothing. For example, India is a very large common law jurisdiction about which I, I know nothing. Um, but I guess my major my major comparisons would be the United States uh, versus the Commonwealth and versus the UK. They, they tend to fall out into having um, somewhat different responses. America has uh, structural features that are not present in any of the, those others. They have um, tort law, for example, is a state matter, so there's no unification under the US Supreme Court of tort doctrine by and large. Some have been constitutionalised, some issues. So you get a great diversity of um, jurisdictions' response to certain problems, and that's in itself an interesting phenomenon to then bring when you go to Australia. Well, Australia, for example, although it's a federal system, the Australian High Court attempts to coordinate and unify tort law in Australia and obviously in the UK you have the Supreme Court being the ultimate court of appeal from both um, Scotland and England and Wales. So it, it has much more of a unified um, appearance. Uh, so I, what, what I, I think is useful for me is that when I'm in the UK I can talk to students about how procedure makes the, the, the way the law looks in the United Kingdom is affected by procedural assumptions that students may not be aware of um, and the same thing in America it looks different in America because of the procedural assumptions that are, that are in place there. So for example in tort law probably the most famous case is Tony and Stevenson that went to the House of Lords as um, on uh, an interim matter an interlocutory matter that wanted to know whether uh, on the facts, if proven, a duty of care would be owed. Now, in the United States, that could not happen because they have um, a rule called the final judgment rule, so that you cannot go up to the appellate level until you've had a final determination by the court, either by the judge throwing the case out or the jury finding a verdict. So that makes a very big difference to what um, the, the dynamics of the trial, but also the structure of appellate decisions. They tend to be addressed to how a judge behaved or how a jury behaved rather than a fundamental decision about, uh, a straightforward decision about whether, for example, a duty was owed. Very interesting. 
So, um, this is the first joint appointment to the Good Heart Chair. Was there any special reason for this? Well, Peter and I are married, <laughs> and I think the faculty um, kindly uh, changed its rules so that we could both come. The, the fact that it's joint is um, nothing to do with us or indeed the university or the faculty. It's got to do with your border agency because uh, orig the original plan was for one of us to have six months in the chair and then the other one to take over. And as we went through, we signed our contracts with the university and then everything was tickety boo and then we went to the border agency to get our visas and they said, well, one of you can have a six months visa and then the other one can have the following six months with a visa, but you couldn't both have visas for the 12 months. So we had to go back to the university and say, sorry, <laughs> we actually wanted to spend the time together. So the university, I think someone told me that this might be the first time ever the University of Cambridge has a professorial job share. So we had to redo the contracts as 12 month contracts. Right. But it's all about the border I agency. See. I, I wondered about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very interesting to have that information actually on record. Mm. Um, uh, in a talk that you gave to the Oxford Law Faculty in May last year, entitled Defining and Refining Yourself as a Legal Scholar, you said, and I quote, that you'd had an idiosyncratic trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I realised that you were referring to your, your BSc and your PhD at um, New South Wales and Adelaide, respectively. And then you also worked here in yes. the chemistry department. And then you finally you, you turned your attention to law. Um, could you elaborate on, on this? <laughs> yes, well, I, I remember I was, <coughs> I was working in the chemical laboratories on Mansfield Road as a postdoc watching the clock and waiting for, for it to be time for me to go home and I thought this was a bad idea so indeed I changed my life um, in the chem labs at Holland Wensville Road. I started out as a scientist because I was um, not brave enough when I left school to follow my interests and decided with my um, father's advice to stick with science because I found maths very straightforward and I was good at science. Um, but even then I didn't really have a passion for science, I just was competent in science and it took me eight years to build up the courage to go into fields that I found more um, interesting. I'm a very slow learner at knowing what I, <laughs> I want to do. Uh, well, having looked at your publications list, I saw that many contained subjects related to cancers and various diseases. Mm with asbestos frequently mentioned, seven mentions since 2003. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you get drawn to this particular subject area? Presumably your science background was key here. I'm not sure it was key. I think, um, I think my science background is helpful to me because I'm not frightened of numbers or scientific concepts. So it's really a confidence thing. That's how, how it helps me. Um, even when I was a scientist, I was interested um, in basic ideas, building blocks, rather than detail, because I have a very, very bad memory. So to cope with my bad memory, I tend to go down deeper into a few things rather than spread my, my vision broadly. Now, when it came to um, finishing my... I did my law degree as a mature age student at the Australian National University and then I came to Oxford to do my DPhil in law and I thought about what I was interested in. I was interested in new technology in the workplace to start with but I, when I actually sat down I thought the only bits of that I was really interested in were the bits to do with the impact on health of new technology and so I, I became interested. Um, this often happens, you don't plan things, you just get interested. And I got interested in the impact of new technology in the workplace. And the form that the impact was having on people was non traumatic. So I became interested in non traumatic injuries. And this had been, a, this was not a field that had been done, um, much more could be done on here. And I remember when I had my first session, my first couple of sessions with my supervisor, Patrick Tia, he thought it. Uh, Everything had been done about compensation for injury, and I kept trying to point out no, it actually hadn't been done for non traumatic injuries. Non traumatic injuries raise very significant issues for the legal system that traumatic injuries don't. 
if I break your leg, we tend to know who broke it, we tend to know where and when it happened, so things like limitation periods are not a problem. But if you're injured non-traumatically, then it might be very difficult to find out who it was that injured you, where they injured you, and when they injured you. So it raised a whole lot of, as I say, these deep fundamental issues that I became uh, interested in. So I did my thesis on um, compensation for non-traumatic injuries, and through that I, of course, became interested in things like cancers, obviously the huge elephant in the room of every legal system at the moment um, is uh, asbestos diseases. Um, very much, very serious issues in South Africa in the mining industry. Mm. Um, similarly, your interest in drug-induced injury, and here I'm thinking of your seminar to the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, with the involvement of the Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency that was in May 2006. Yes, I, I, talk, um, I talk at the British Institute a fair bit because I'm very interested in um, talking um, to audiences at the bench and the bar. In fact, I'd say I, I actually write for the bench and the bar rather than other academics. So for me, it's very helpful to, to present my work to them because they often have such insightful comments to um, um, the conversation with groups like that is very useful. So yes, I, I, I'm interested in pharmaceuticals, again, for the same reasons that pharmaceutical injuries tend to be um, ones where it's problematic proving your causal connection. It may be, you can't remember exactly which maker of that particular pharmaceutical was the one you took. Um, there are insurance problems. So it's, it's the whole constellation of issues which are similar to uh, the sort of issues that are raised by other non-traumatic agents, such as asbestos. Um, with the explosion of the numbers of modern drugs, presumably this is an area of great activity, and I wondered how the regulatory authorities stand in the crossfire between the patients and, say, commercial companies. Well, I'm not, I'm not a great expert on regulation, but I think one of the phenomena that you see is the difference, getting back to the comparative law, that there's a huge difference between um, how uh, tort law operates in the United States in relation to pharmaceutical injuries and here. To my knowledge, there hasn't been one successful judgment of damages against a pharmaceutical company in the United Kingdom, which is extraordinary given how many um, cases are brought uh, and successfully brought in the United States. So you might say that well, that that's reflects well on the regulatory regime in the United Kingdom. Alternatively, it could be simply a reflection of how high the barriers to um, access to justice are in the United Kingdom. It's a very bold person who would take a claim, especially against a pharmaceutical company, where the costs of preparing your case are going to be so huge that it would deter anyone but someone who either had a lot of money or, until recently, was able to get backing from legal aid. Um, I'm also very interested in your wide-ranging geographical <laughs> legal expertise, because you currently hold the position of Ernest E. Smith Professor of Law at the University of Texas at Austin. And, and how did this connection develop? Uh, it's very interesting, and it's interesting to... I often tell students about this because when I was um, Patrick Atiyah's student, a PhD student, um, he t gave me wonderful advice about career and various things. And what, one of the first things he said to me, unlike um, my first person I started out with, first person I started out with in Oxford, um, who, who was more of an expert in um, workplace relations, had said, "Well, if you're going to go." look at compensation and tort law. Don't just just don't go near America. It's a quagmire, don't go near America. And when I ch decided I really just wanted to do torts and I moved to Patrick, he said, the first thing he said to me, well, if you're going to do a torts thesis, you must engage with American materials. So this is diametrically yeah. impossible. So I said, well, how do you do that? Because it's so vast. And he said, what you do is you find out a couple of people whose work you admire and you read all their work. And then if that, if that happens, those few people keep referring to another scholar, then you branch out and read that person's 
work and so on. And this enables you to build out from quality without getting bogged down in the endless number of articles that are um, published. One of the people I then early on identified as someone whose work I really admired was a man called Bill Powers. And he wrote, um, not a lot, but he wrote on product liability in the States. And when I finished my doctorate, I decided I'd write a book on product liability. And I read a lot of his work. And I became an expert in American product liability because the, the law that had just been adopted in the UK was modeled on the American system. So uh, when I had to assess what I thought of the American system, I came to conclusions which were fairly um, unusual. Most Americans weren't saying these things, but one of the few people who uh, was saying things like this was Bill. And uh, another thing Patrick had, had said to me was that the, if you admire someone, you should send them your work. And I thought this was very bold, and he said this was standard practice, for example, in the United States, which it is. So I was bold enough to send my book to Bill, who then wrote back enthusiastically that he and I agreed on things, and so fast forward a few years, he kept saying, you must come to Texas. And I said, no, I have some children, and I'm teaching in Oxford. But when I moved back to Australia, he said, to a research chair, he said, well, now your children are older, you're not burdened by teach, uh, teaching, so come and visit. And when I got there, he basically said, well, I think I'm going to become dean. I'd like you to take over my courses in product cycles here. And so it was really a meeting of minds that enabled me to um, make the entry into American tort law was really that Very idiosyncratic <laughs> yes. career and move. When you say your book, which you, you uh, presented to him, was this book on product liability. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, but the, that book is was initiated because the European Union, as it now is, uh, passed a directive in 1987 on products liability, and I decided I would write just a little commentary on that. But I just had my second child, and it took <laughs> a couple of years, it took six years to write that book. And the reason for that was that, I, again, I was more interested, in, when I looked at it, in not, I was interested in the fundamental reasons why this law had been created. So that took me into American materials, and the American materials were not only vast in terms of case law, but it had become the field on which theorists practiced their new theories. So I, it has a lot of theory in it as well as a lot of American law. Um, and that's why it's took to me so long. And the um, EC directive, which you mentioned, mm. was of course implemented here by the very far reaching Consumer Protection Act. And you said uh, in page four, on page four in this book, that in 1994, tort lawyers were bewildered agnostics about the direction and fate of tort law. And do you feel that this is still the case 18 years on? I think what had happened is that there'd been a move um, following, I suppose, reached its most um, impressive moment when New Zealand abolished tort law for personal injury by accident and set up a compensation scheme. And there were moves in this country, very vocal um, commentators, uh, urging the same move here. And so there was this moment where it looked like tort law was going in that direction, that is, it was going to be replaced by a compensation scheme. By the early 90s, that had that moment had, had gone, there'd been the Thatcher years, and Patrick Gautier, who, for example, had been a champion of the, of the Woodhouse uh, scheme in New Zealand, had changed in line with what he felt was realistic politically. And so in the early 90s, people were, I think, not knowing where the future of tort would go. I think now everyone's accepted that it's not going to be replaced by any sort of compensation scheme, except maybe in a few areas where people are still interested, such as uh, medical negligence or pharmaceutical injuries. So I think now it's resolved itself back to the old regime. You can just tick on being a Rolls Royce uh, regime for people who are rich, but but behind that, in the shadow of what, what would go on in courts, people are still settling claims, accident claims on the road and at work and so on. So it's still as it was when I went to law school in the late 70s. Very interesting. You conclude um, in your book that the directive, and I quote, disrupts and inhibits the development of civil liability 
along broad rational principles while threatening to have an unfair and a haphazard impact on certain market sectors. Mm. And I found that very interesting. Yes, I think what the Americans found too was uh, that they thought in their their rule, which was created in the late um, 50s and early 60s, uh, they thought they were going to get what's called strict liability for products. But when the law was restated in uh, the, the 1990s, it was revealed that after 40 years, what had really happened was it had taken courts that long to appreciate that they were not willing to impose genuine strict liability on manufacturers for the design or warning condition of their products. And so it had taken a lot of time to appreciate that that, that w was really what was going to happen. So you've got this odd situation where um, there's one set of injuries that has this special set of rules, that is when you're injured by a product and there's no rational reason why product injuries deserved a particular response rather than say medical negligence injuries and so the, it, it's it's, um, it's, it's a, an anomaly within the broad sweep of normal principles that in private law would apply regardless of the particular type of agent that has broken your leg whether it's a product or a doctor or some other some other agent why is why a product special is still a question that's not been answered satisfactorily and so I still would agree with what I wrote then that is that it has introduced an anomalous um, distinction between um, those who've been injured Nice. In society. Um, coming to your your earlier book that was Disease and the Compensation Debate, 1986 OUP, and you identify a general failure in tort to compensate for insidious disabilities in contrast to traumatic disabilities, and you alluded to this at the beginning of our interview, and you ask why should the system favour accident over disease? Uh, and what is the state of play today? Well, it's as I said before. I mean, it's 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 only a, a sort of um, inevitable result of the difficulties of proof that it's it's very hard to identify. Often in these cases, and we're finding this with asbestos, it's very hard to identify whose fibres in that case were the ones that triggered your cancer. We know very little about how cancer is caused to begin with. And then when it's possible that one of many different sources of fibre um, had been involved, uh, it presents people with great difficulties. Then if the legal system wants to respond, as it did in mesothelioma in the case of Fairchild, you then have a very significant exception to the normal proof rules, which puts pressure on other areas because people say, well, if they're getting a special proof rule for mesothelioma, what about me? What about me in my particular context? I've got lung cancer, I've never smoked, and I've been exposed to radon in my house, and I've got lung cancer. Could I, can I have a claim? Can I have a special rule of proof? So I think it's not so much that the that there's some uh, deity in the sky saying we're going to be crueler and more demanding of victims of non-traumatic injury. It's just the nature of how orthodox proof rules operate that it makes it very, very difficult for these people within a private law system to secure compensation. Well, Professor Stapleton, I'm extremely grateful to you for a very interesting account. Thank you so much.